Hi, everyone. This is Rabbi Rachel Davidson. I work with Rabbi Raina Grossman here at Lionsgate, and I'm here to bring to you a short Jewish studies class. Today, we'll be focusing on the story of various women in the book of Exodus, and especially at the very beginning of the book of Exodus. And we'll be looking about what, the, what their lives and the stories about them can teach us. So I want to begin by saying the blessing that you say for Torah study. If you're unfamiliar, it is the same blessing that we use when we light candles at the very beginning, except instead of saying, Lahadlik ner shel Shabbat, we'll say, La'asok bedivre Torah. So feel free to say it with me, or you can say Amen when I'm done saying it. So, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok B'divre Torah. So we'll be diving first into some of the texts from Exodus from the very beginning of the book, and then we'll be looking at a few midrashim about these women. And we're going to focus in on Shifra and Pua, Miriam, and um, Pharaoh's daughter, Bat Far Paro. So there's a few other women who we won't be talking about today, but just so you know, there's also Yocheved, who is Moses' mother, and there's also Tsipora, Moses' wife. And all of these characters are really fascinating and rich and interesting. I just thought these were maybe the best ones to focus on for today. But if you ever want to talk about any of the others or anything else on your mind, please feel free to call over to the rabbi's office. And me or Rabbi Grossman would love to have a conversation with you. So I want to begin today by looking at Shifra and Pua. So some of you may have heard about them in the past. They were two midwives who um, served the Israelite women. And in addition, they were supposed to carry out the orders of the Pharaoh. So many of you might already know at the beginning of the book of Exodus, the children of Israel were in a fairly dire circumstance. They came to Israel a few generations prior, seeking safety and shelter and food during a famine. And after a few generations, the Pharaoh no longer dealt kindly with them and instead feared them because of how much they were reproducing and decided to turn them into slaves and to start a genocide against them. So this is where the story of the midwives, Shifra and Pua, comes in. So we'll be reading from Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, saying, When you deliver the Hebrew woman, look at the birth stool. If it is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, fearing God, did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing, letting the boys live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous. Before the midwife can come to them, they have given birth. And God dealt with the midwives, dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and increased greatly. So we can see a few things about Shifra and Pua from this passage. One is that they're very brave, right? They were willing not only to disobey Pharaoh's orders, they were also willing to lie directly to his face. Now, personally, I can't imagine walking up to an authority figure, let alone the Pharaoh of all of Egypt, a mighty empire, and just saying, oh, you know, by the time we get there, they're already gone. You know, it feels very casual almost, which I think speaks to their bravery and the strength of their convictions. We also learn a little bit about the biblical value system. 
So in modern American values, it's very important to be honest and tell the truth. And that's viewed as perhaps one of our highest values. But in the Tanakh, we actually see many examples where hiding the truth and covering something up is really important and is actually something that people are rewarded for by God. And so Shifra and Pua lying to save Hebrew lives is part of what gets them a reward from God. So I, of course, do not condone lying. I believe honesty is important. But I do think it's interesting to think about in cases of survival, how value systems might change. Now, one thing that isn't readily visible when we first look at that text is that it's a little unclear exactly who Shifra and Pua are. It says that they were the midwives of the Hebrews, and it's actually unclear if they were Egyptian women who helped Israelite women or if they were Israelites themselves. So I think either way, it can be very nice to imagine these women who were willing to stick up for others or stick up for members of their own community and who were really putting their lives on the line to help others. Now, I don't know about you, but just to think about our contemporary moment for a minute, I am spending a lot of time thinking about the healthcare workers who are going in every day to hospitals to take care of people who are sick, despite the fact that it could endanger their own lives. And so I think no one is obligated to do that, right? We all have to protect our own lives first, but we can really feel grateful and feel blessed from the courage and bravery that our healthcare workers are showing right now during this extremely difficult time. So if we keep going, I want to look at the story of Miriam and Batparo, Pharaoh's daughter. And the two stories are actually very intertwined. So just a little bit of context before we dive in, and we'll come back to this. Miriam is known as a Nivya, as a prophetess, a female prophet. Um, and so one of the Midrashim that we're looking at later on will explore what does it mean that she was a prophet. But be on the lookout as we read through the Tanakh texts for anything you see that might speak to prophecy that Miriam was given. So we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw how beautiful he was, she hid him for three months. So the narrator hasn't told you this, but this little baby is actually Moses, and this is his mother, Yocheved. When she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket for him and cocked it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child into it and placed it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. So of course, many of you might know this already. The Nile is a very dangerous river. It is huge and strong and mighty and filled with crocodiles. So Yocheved, Moses' mother, was really, this was a last ditch effort. She couldn't take care of this child anymore. He was going to be killed. So she's really putting a lot of trust and saying, all right, I'm gonna let him go and hope that God takes care of him or hope for the best. And his sister stationed herself at a distance to learn what would befall him. So that sister is Miriam, Moses' sister, and she's placing herself right near the basket to try to make sure that the baby is okay. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the Nile while her maidens walked along the Nile. She spied the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to fetch it. When she opened it, she saw that it was a child, a boy crying. Then, I'm sorry, she took pity on it and said, this must be a Hebrew child. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a Hebrew nurse to suckle the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter answered, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will pay your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, 
She brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, who made him her son. She named him Moses, explaining, I drew him out of the water. In Hebrew, the word masha has this drawing forth connotation. So there's a pun there. Miriam bravely looked out for her brother, while Pharaoh's daughter risks her father's wrath to take in a child. So again, at this point in the Exodus story, we see two large acts of bravery, right? We see Miriam kind of going down to this dangerous place. Who knows what Egyptian taskmasters might be there looking for her or looking for some Israelite. But she decides it's really important to look out for her brother. And Pharaoh's daughter sees this baby, knows that the baby must be an Israelite, and decides to do something that could get her into a lot of trouble with her father, right? She's not just some random Egyptian woman taking in a baby. She is like Davka. She's exactly Pharaoh's daughter. So a true act of bravery there. I also think something interesting that we see is that Pharaoh's daughter could have believed everything her father said. She could have believed that the Israelites were a danger to her people, that they were untrustworthy and traitorous, that they were going to take over the land. And she could have said, I'm going to let this baby go. I don't think it's really fully human. Instead, she looks at this baby and she sees a person. She sees an innocent baby, like hopefully all of us would. And she decides that it's worth the risk to take in this baby. And then I think it also is really an act of compassion that she says, I'm going to hire the baby's mother as a wet nurse. So she says, not only can I protect this baby, I can keep the baby connected to his biological family, to his Israelite family, and let him learn the ways of the Israelites and not be totally cut off from his community. So I think Bat Paro, Pharaoh's daughter, is really doing a selfless act here by helping this baby. So when we look at the ancient rabbis, we actually find that they too were very impressed by the bravery of these women. And I'm going to focus in on the commentary about Miriam and about Pharaoh's daughter. So we'll first look at a... Um, at a midrash, a classical commentary and explanation that's recorded in the Talmud, in the tractate Megillah. So we don't know exactly when this was written, but we can guess that it was written between 220 CE and 600 CE. So they're exploring, what does it mean that Miriam was a prophetess? What prophecy did she receive? And they say, she prophesied when she was the sister of Aaron. So when Aaron was Moses' oldest brother, then Miriam was in the middle, then Moses. So she had one older brother, and she said, My mother is destined to bear a son who will save Israel. When Moses was born, the whole house was filled with light, and her father arose and kissed her on the head, saying, my daughter, your prophecy has been fulfilled. But when they threw him into the river, her father arose and tapped her on the head, saying, Daughter, where is your prophecy? That is why it was written, and his sister stood from afar off to know. To know, what does it mean that she knew that she would have a brother, that kind of thing? It meant that this would be the latter part of her prophecy. So here we learn that the reason Miriam is called a prophetess is because she knew she was going to have a brother and she knew that she had to protect him, right? I think this is an interesting take on prophecy. The prophecy isn't just hearing the word of God, but it is in fact helping the word of God come into being. Miriam not only received the information that she was going to have a second brother who would save the Israelite people, she also took that information and said, I have to make sure that my brother is able to grow up. And that was why she went down to the river. So finally, I want to share a little bit more about Batya, about um, Pharaoh's daughter. And I've already hinted a little bit at what I'm going to share next. So... 
In the book of Chronicles, the last book of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, um, we learn about a figure named Batparo, the daughter of Pharaoh, who is named Batya, which means daughter of God. She's listed in a long set of lineages. There's not much else about her. But when the classical rabbis look at this, they say to themselves, Batparo, her name was Batya. I wonder if this is the same Bat Paro from the Exodus story. So in Vayikra Rabbah, we get more information about this. This is a slightly later um, Midrashic text, probably from the early medieval period. So they say, in Chronicles it is written, these were the sons of Bitya, daughter of Pharaoh. Rabbi Yehoshua taught in the name of Rabbi Levi, that the Holy One said to Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh, Moses was not your son, yet you called him your son. You too, though you are not my daughter, yet I will call you my daughter. This is why it says these were the sons of Bitya, daughter of Pharaoh. So Bitya is not quite Batya, daughter of God, but the rabbis see that and they say, oh, it means she was the daughter of God. And just as she adopted Moses, so too was she adopted by God. So too was she brought close. So I know that we're all living in a time when it is difficult to be brave. And when it is difficult to even just move through our daily lives. There's an idea that Mitzrayim comes from the word, Mitzrayim means Egypt in Hebrew. That Mitzrayim comes from the word Metzar, narrowness. And I think that this Passover, as we approach Passover, we are living in a very narrow time. We're feeling very confined. But just as these women did their best during the enslavement in Mitzrayim, the enslavement in Egypt, to feel broad and expansive and brave, I hope that you too can tap into your inner bravery to help each other, to reach out to your family and friends, to move through the days when things are difficult. And if there's ever anything that you would like to talk over about this class or in general, please feel free to call over to the rabbi's office. Have a good afternoon.